Francis Bain Kamabach, an attorney at law, is the Chief Legal and External Affairs Officer at Ansa Macau Limited, the holding company of the largest indigenous conglomerate in the Caribbean. She is the Corporate Secretary to the Board of Ansa Macau Limited and is a Director on the Board of Ansa Bank Limited. Frances brings 16 years of corporate experience to her current role of leading the Ansa Macau's groups legal, corporate, and external affairs, internal audit, and enterprise risk management functions, and is a member of the group's executive leadership team. As the chief legal officer of Ansa Macal Group, she has oversight of legal services, legal risk management, commercial and corporate transactions, regulatory and compliance matters, and litigation. As corporate secretary, she is responsible for driving board governance and ensuring good corporate governance practices and procedures are maintained across the Ansa Macal group. So just as we uh, set the stage for Francis's contribution, I'm going to ask Christy to play a short video from Ansa Macal. This place is ours, our store of natural capital, and it is our duty to protect and sustain our biodiversity now and into the future. That's why as a group, Ansa Macal has defined its sustainability business priorities and is committed to investing in a sustainable future. One such investment is circular economies, which goes beyond reusing and recycling materials. You know, some of our most notable uh, achievements, I would say, are in the recycling and the reuse space in our beverage business. So our glass bottles are across three of our four breweries are actually washed and reused up to 11 times, which supports uh, you know, reduction of waste and also reduction of energy. So at Glassworks, we utilizing the colors, utilizing used glass in our process of making new glass. And then for our polymer division, we have the process of making new crates from old crates for Cari Brewery. Once we're able to get 40 to 60% of recycled glass or colored, in our process, we are definitely able to make a more sustainable bottle every single time. To see how this works, let's follow the journey of a Carib Brewery bottle. At Carib, we have a very unique um, process. We're the only manufacturer that um, does a returnable packaging. The first thing we do is to sort them. The bottles are then fed into our packaging line where they're washed. They go through a very extensive cleaning process and then it's filled with, with whatever beverage we're making and then pasteurized and, and labeled and packed um, before sending out to the consumer. I am very proud to be part of a company that incorporates recycled materials. We have a fantastic team of managers and engineers who push the envelope to ensure that we figure out new and exciting ways to utilize uh, recycled materials. The group wants to be an instrument of change. So we have to be able to measure the impact, how much we are reducing our adverse effects, how we are increasing positive outcomes for not just us, but for the wider community. What Ans Macal has basically decided to do is to pay just as much importance to our non-financial metrics as we do to our financial metrics. Our sustainability strategy is defined by our purpose, which is inspiring better choices for a better world. So our group reduce, reuse, recycle program is going to start with phase one at all of our answer locations in Trinidad, whereby employees can bring in returnable bottles produced by Cara Brewery, as well as other types of glass for recycling. We must recognize this is one planet and we're all just passing through here and the effects that we create and the possibility that we leave would be relied on for generations to come. You are part of the puzzle and you are part of the solution. Let's keep innovating. By teaming up with Ansa Macal, we can really make a great difference together. Recognize in all that you do, what it means beyond your own time here and be supportive of uh, a future where your choices could inspire even better choices for those to come.
Good morning. Good morning, Chairman and Directors of CCGI, fellow speakers and panelists, and to everyone who has joined us today from across the Caribbean region to partake in this very important discussion, which has implications for all of us. It is a privilege to be able to speak to this distinguished audience on a topic about which I am so passionate, the circular economy. We know that the circular economy is essentially about sustainability. I'm going to be a little controversial and say that sustainability is not new to business at all. Let's face it, from the very inception of business, sustainability has been a primary focus. Sustainability has been a primary focus, financial sustainability. Every company aims to be financially sustainable. From time immemorial, directors were and still are charged with the responsibility of ensuring that a company remains financially viable in the long term. What has changed today is the context for that financial sustainability. This new context considers not just, a not just that a company is financially sustainable, but how it achieves that financial sustainability is now of critical importance. An interesting question in my mind is why is this suddenly very important in recent years? Sadly, it isn't true to say that the signs weren't there, that we didn't know the earth's resources were being depleted, that nature and biodiversity were being threatened, that there was, that there was social inequality and injustice. No folks. We chose to have our eyes wide shut. The alarm bells were being rung for some time now. Allow me a little segue to quote a few lines from an old calypso sung in 1980, written by the brilliant Trimbegonian songwriter, Winsford Devine, and sung by the much loved King Austin. When will it end? It is plain to see universally this land is not bountiful as it was, simply because in his quest for success, nothing stands in man's way. Old rivers run dry. Soon the birds will no longer fly. The mountains will no longer be high. I see charity deplored, equal rights totally ignored. Soil that wouldn't bear, children making children to be a part of this growing mass. And I ask, if this is progress, how long will it last? Words which have the same meaning that they had 43 years ago, when I would have been no more than nine years old. As one writer put it, this song was a critique of the ideology and practice of progress from the vantage points of environmental unsustainability, exploitation, inequality, and the resultant social strife. Sustainability, ESG, etc., aren't news hot off the press, guys. We have been ignoring the holistic meaning of sustainability and the role that each of us plays in making this a way of being across the world and not a novelty. What I believe is different today is that the pressure being applied to business by the wider stakeholder pool has accelerated the push to action with a sense of urgency because quite simply, we are now in crisis. On one occasion, when President Obama was interviewed, he was asked what advice he would give to young people starting their careers. His response was, be the person who presents as someone who is willing and able to solve problems. Be a person of action. He said in his career, he had come across a lot of people who could very eloquently identify a problem and tell you why something is not working. He said there were fewer people who show themselves as having the capacity to act to solve problems. Our very existence is under threat. With no planet B 
as a contingency plan. As far as business is concerned, it is now undeniable that the way we treat our environment and the way we address societal needs and issues impacts financial sustainability. Businesses must address their impact on the environment and society to be able to stay in business and also for us to still have a planet on which to live. The new reality will undoubtedly impact how companies are being governed. And of course, the change should start at the top. All boards must put their companies on an accelerated path to sustainability and circular economy. Let's take a look at the recent client earth shell uh, litigation, which shed some light on emerging trends regarding the board's responsibility for ensuring that their companies tackle sustainability challenges. The environmental law charity client Earth filed a suit against 11 Shell directors personally. Let me say that again. Filed a suit against 11 Shell directors personally. Client Earth alleged that the 11 members of Shell's board were mismanaging client risk, climate risk and breaching company, company law by failing to implement an energy transition strategy aligned with the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Now let's understand something. Client Earth has a grand total of 27 shares out of 7 billion Shell shares in issue. Even though the claim got the backing of institutional shareholders with over 12 million shares in the company in total, that only makes up approximately 1% of, share, of, of Shell's shareholding. The claim is thought to be the first case in the world seeking to hold a board of directors personally liable for failure to properly prepare for the energy transition. The case was recently dismissed last month in the UK High Court, and the court has given Client Earth permission to make oral representation for the court to reconsider its decision. Regardless of the outcome of this case, it is a sign of emerging trends, which could have significant implications for other companies and their boards. Meanwhile, two of the UK's largest pension schemes have said that they will vote against the reappointment of top directors at BP and Shell unless the companies strengthen commitments to tackling carbon emissions. They say the move is part of a drive to push oil companies and banks to make faster progress on climate change pledges. Other asset, management, as, other asset managers are also increasingly targeting board members over a lack of progress on climate change. During the panel discussion on day one of Governance Week, the opening ceremony, I believe it was the esteemed Camille Facey who said that the Shell case is an example of how money slash business fights against progress made on ESG issues. Sadly, it made me think about the fact that right here in my beloved country, Trinidad and Tobago, there are those who have successfully lobbied against the enactment of beverage container legislation for the last 30 years. And even now, when time is running out, we must collectively in our local and regional countries cause a push to action on these issues. So what then, is the board's roadmap to govern, to govern in the current and evolving stakeholder environment. First of all, the board must address corporate or business purpose. What is business purpose? It is the company's why. Why does the company exist? It involves a collected, collective effort which is set by the board and company executives, but it is also shared with and inspires all employees and is embodied in the company's culture. 
a purpose that is specific to a company's history, culture, relevancy to the market, and competitive strategy, and to its stakeholders, is one that is more likely to resonate as being authentic. So for Ansa Macal, the board embarked on an exercise in 2020 to define the company's purpose. After approximately a year of interviews with leadership and brainstorming with various parties, both internal and external, Ansa Macal's purpose statement was approved by the board in November, 2021. As you would have heard earlier in the video at the start of my presentation, Ansa Macal's purpose is inspiring better choices for a better world. This forms the basis of our sustainability strategy. A board should ensure that its composition fits its new purpose. It is in the board's interest to reorganize itself and review the roles, duties, and competencies, processes, and collective skill set in the context of the company's purpose. Increased diversity and new roles are necessary to recognize that value creation is not just about financial gain. Between 2020 and 2023, the Ansa Macal board appointed five new independent directors, three of whom were women, two of whom had working experience in the area of corporate sustainability practices. In 2022, a sustainability officer was hired. To be in a good position to resist the temptation to jump on every bandwagon, it is important for a company to understand its own priorities in meeting sustainability challenges that are right for it. During this period, Ansa Macal mentioned earlier, Ansa Macal defined and then redefined our sustainability business priorities and our ESG pillars in support of those priorities. In setting those priorities, we conducted a materiality assessment through an independent third party to seek the views of all of our stakeholders, including employees, customers, and consumers of varying genders and ages, regulators, our suppliers, etc. We also internally looked at, at factors which we believed had a material impact on our business and where we believe our business operations have an impact on the environment, our employees, and the society as a whole. Impact stewardship is one of those priorities and it involves knowing our impact, reducing adverse effects, and enhancing positive outcomes. Depending on the level of sustainability maturity of the core business model, it may be possible for the company to set quantitative and qualitative targets based on information already available. One way to start is to look at your current manufacturing processes to identify areas of improvement. In your site's current state, can you confidently claim that the technologies you use minimize waste, optimize energy efficiency, and reduce water consumption? You are likely to require external specialist assistance to conduct a data, data discovery exercise even if you have already been collecting data in some areas. In many, in many of our businesses at Ansa Macal, we were able to set qualitative targets based on data already being collected. After we set targets, we formalized them by including them in the balanced scorecards of all subsidiaries within the group. The inclusion of ESG targets in the company's balanced scorecard means that they are tied to the compensation of every single Ansa Macal executives, executive. Ideally, companies' priorities and its targets should, set, should be set within the context of benchmarking against the company's peers in the same industry. Benchmarking may focus on what the peers' sustainability strategy pillars and objectives and material topics are, it should also focus on governance. How does the pair govern its company and sustainability strategy initiatives? Another area is risk. Does the pair consider sustainability risk in its business operations and how? Reporting. 
which ESG metrics and targets does the payer have for measuring sustainability? What standards and frameworks does it use? What innovative initiatives does the payer have or plan on implementing to achieve impact in material issues? Any gaps coming out of that assessment should be assessed in a systematic way. Ansem Akal is currently in this phase of activity, and we hope to complete a full assessment of at least four of our major sectors by early to mid next year. The centrality of business model transformation must be on the board's agenda as a number one priority. Monitoring progress on this transformational roadmap should be a standing agenda item with close attention being paid to such matters as raw materials, energy efficiency, supply chain resilience, waste management, reputational risk, and contingency planning. The Ansem Akal Board Governance Nomination Remuneration Committee currently receives at least quarterly updates on the progress of our sustainability strategy. And sustainability risk has recently been incorporated into our enterprise risk management framework, which is monitored by the board's audit and risk committee. A board should regularly review its functioning and, and effectiveness in delivering transformation. Boards need to improve objective director selection procedures, development programs, sustainable reward policies, and conduct full board assessments. Now, all of these lofty sustainability goals and targets are fantastic, but are not likely to go anywhere unless there is a strong culture behind it that permeates through to every level of the organization. At Ansem Macal, we conducted a culture audit to understand the current culture and address any pain points to be in a better position to solve these and close any gaps in culture, which could negatively impact us, our strategy. We also recently redefined our company's core values in the context of the new company purpose and growth agenda of doubling our size and scale to become a $2 billion company by 2027. How all of the company's sustainability efforts are communicated to stakeholders is a crucial element of building trust. So let's talk a little bit about sustainability reporting. What is it all about? Is it an expensive sideshow? Will it become a necessary evil? Will it save the planet? How a board approaches the task of sustainability reporting will determine how well it will be able to respond to the current rapid changes in the sustainability reporting landscape. The link between sustainability and sustainability reporting is that corporate purpose is intrinsic to the relationship with stakeholders. Employees want to work in companies in which they can believe. Investors are looking for the company's prospects for the long term. Many consumers are making their purchases on ethical grounds. External interests consider how the company's activities benefit or potentially negative, negatively impact them. Reporting itself is an outcome of purpose and strategy. A company's success is dependent on business strategy, investment, and a myriad of day-to-day -day business decisions based on the health of its financial systems. An excellent sustainability report is the product of a business that is already systematic in successfully building sustainability perspectives into its strategy, investment, and governance. Most of all, it is a business that has addressed its own corporate purpose. The ability to collect data accurately and to have that data be able to be verified are critical to the integrity of a company's sustainability reporting. The board must ensure that there are systems and procedures in place to ensure that reporting is accurate 
accountants, auditors, both internal and external, will play a key role here, just as much as they do for financial reporting. There will ultimately be a need for digitalization of data collection to ensure efficiency and accuracy of data collection for reporting purposes. Ansem McCall published its first sustainability report this year, both integrated in our 2022 annual report, as well as a standalone document. Both forms are available on our social media platforms, as well as on our website. It explains the changes we are making to our cooperating model to reduce our adverse effects, some of the targets that we have set and so on. It is by no means perfect, but it is a clear demonstration of our recognition of the urgency of the times in which we live. For us, sustainability is a journey of constant improvement and not a one-off activity. As we progress with our data discovery and data collection exercise, we will make a determination around the most suitable reporting standards for our businesses. We also continue to observe very closely the move to standardization in the sustainability reporting landscape in Europe, the United States, and at a global level, backed by regulators, investors, and by governments. I would now like to share with you a short video of our latest investment in growth and sustainability at Carib Brewery. We have invested over $200 million. Let me say that again. We have invested over $200 million on a new returnable package, pack, packaging line to increase capacity locally and in our export markets. This new line will use less water for bottle washing and pasteurization than conventional lines. Also recycling of water for the pasteurizer has been included. The motor and controls for the new line are more energy efficient and therefore use less electricity. Christy, if you can play that video for me now so that we can share with the audience. The technology we'll be using on, on line seven, which is this, this project is going to be called, um, is going to ensure that our water consumption is reduced and our energy consumption is reduced. This is all part of our sustainability initiatives that, that we're focused here on. Uh, and it's in combination with many other initiatives we're doing in filtration and other projects to really eliminate our impact on the environment. This line is going to ensure that we can supply our markets well into the future, um, on time and in full, and most importantly, with very high quality products. Thank you, Christy. I wish I had more time to continue speaking, but I will close now, close my remarks today by saying that successful companies anticipate change and find their own solutions ahead of the curve. We are all proudly Caribbean. What will history say about the time in which we live? Would it be seen as a period of radical change? or mere incremental steps in a very critical time. Thank you. Wow. I, I want to capture those final questions there, Francis. That was absolutely incredible. I, I so loved your entire presentation today from beginning to end. It's, it is so filled with so many important learnings for us. So um, I, I especially love the calypso that you shared, the lyrics to it. We, we must all um, find that and, and learn it because it certainly helps bring to bear, as you say, sustainability is not new. It was identified many years ago. It's just taken us this point to get a crisis and to have stakeholders pressure for businesses to begin to take point, take note of it. I, I like that you mentioned that this is not, um, this has to be a way of being now. 
it's, it's a journey and it's continuous improvement as we move forward. And I find it is an incredible story that you have shared with us here as to how Ansa Makal has been able to take a look at itself and from at the board level, begin to craft by starting at the very first step, which is to, to identify again, what is your purpose? So what, what I want to ask you to, to elaborate on a little bit first, I, I loved what you shared in terms of the impact stewardship model. You know, because there, there's so much that we already know with respect to um, the, the need for us to look at the impact on climate and, and look at how people are impacted as well. But this particular model, because I, I really like how you integrated to the fact that this was all done by the collection of data take any time to truly be able to understand so that even when it comes to your reporting, you would have the integrity of the data to demonstrate what exactly it is that um, ANSA is reporting on that has been the achievement. So um, tell us a little bit in terms of what, if it's possible, what really propelled ANSA, what was that turning point? that helped it to say, okay, let's stop. Let's pause for a minute. Let's take what appeared to me to have been a year of where everyone went back to the drawing board to understand and, and re-identify the purpose of answer in order to have this new thrust. What did that take? And, and then explain to us again in terms of arriving at the impact stewardship model. Okay. so. Just as a matter of context, sustainability was not, and what we realized in when we were doing this exercise, as you say, this, this turning point, we realized and we it became very, very apparent that we were doing a lot of this stuff already. All right. What was happening is that in many cases we were not measuring it, but in some cases we were measuring it. So where we did have the data, so for example, at Carburi they were already measuring their water consumption. They know how much water they use, how much it takes to make a, a, a pint of beer or hectoliter of beer or whatever it is. They have that data already. They know how much, because they also, by the way, they also uh, recapture CO2 in the process and reuse it in the process. So that is also something that is, that is uh, sustainable. So the business model in and of itself was already sustainable for Carberry and for, for many of our companies as well. Um, I think we were, we were always keeping in touch with what the trends were and how things were going. I think the average person, if you're honest with yourself, you, you walk down the street, you, you go down the islands in Trinidad and Tobago anyway, you see plastic bottles, okay, floating around. We have flooding that's happening um, every rainy season and sometimes outside of the rainy season. It's happening and it's climate change is clear. It's apparent. So in other words, as an entity and one of the largest entities in the region, we saw ourselves as having a responsibility to double down on already existing sustainability efforts and actually increase the structure and framework, standardize it, formalize it, and start driving it because there is a sense of urgency to do so. And we don't want to be waiting until we have to be told that we, we need to do or up our game. We wanna up our game before that time happens. So that coupled with the introduction of a new CEO who is very young and energetic <laughs> and, and has of course a perspective on the world uh, what is important, he also has young kids and wants to see that his kids live in a country and in a world, in a region that is sustainable. Yeah. So Ansa Macal has been around for 140 years. So sustainability, again, is not new to us. What we want to ensure is that we make sure that our game is on that we are around for a further 140 years plus. So that constant looking and thinking long-term is what 
would have triggered at that particular point in time uh, a desire to really double down on efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so would you say, because I'm, I'm, as you say, Ansel McCall is 140 years old, it's been in the region, and it has been in the practice of collecting data and measuring its impact on certain things. But I'm, I'm trying to identify exactly what was the, the catalyst for that big move, because a lot of organizations may be at the point that you were at before. So what did it take? Was, was it the fact that you had a younger CEO who came in with a different focus and was able to then persuade the board, let's take a pause, let's relook, rethink, and refocus our purpose? Yes, certainly the CEOs, the group CEOs vision would have been uh, the key, I would say, a key driving factor in pausing and relooking at our current practices and so on. And his desire to make a difference and to give the team the, the authority and leeway to make decisions to get us to that point. So I have the, the overarching responsibility for our sustainability initiatives at corporate, but each of our leaders, the people who run the businesses, who run the operations that really have the impact, those people have been empowered to make decisions that can redesign their business models, that can, that can improve the impact that biz our businesses have on the environment, on society, on people, etc. Okay, lovely. So I want to answer your question, it would be leadership. And, and just, just for the record as well, the board did not take much convincing. Ah. So it wasn't as if it was a lobby that the CEO had to do to, the board actually was um, on board and excited by the possibilities of the roadmap that was presented to them and that they ultimately approved. And that is why they consistently um, receive very happily updates on what we're doing and how we're progressing in this regard. Okay, great. So you actually did answer what was to be my follow-up question, <laughs> but I want to invite persons. I know that many um, would have really enjoyed your presentation as well. So if there's anyone who would like to ask a question, who would like to make a comment or anything, you can either raise your hand so we could identify you or if you'd like to put that question or comment in the chat, that would absolutely be fine as well. So while a person thinks that true, Francis, I'm not looking to get you in trouble. <laughs> of course, Carmen, never, never. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll, I'll, um, I'll um, exercise my right to silence if I need to. <laughs> I'll be as transparent as I, as I can with you. Sure, okay. Because um, you know here, you are no stranger to CCGI. You know that in our sessions, we try to be as candid as possible and to address issues that, that really could make a practical difference in how people can go about improving things. And I just find that this is really such a wonderful learning. So we need to dig deeper into it to get at, you know, what may have been some of the challenges to be overcome. So, okay, so we get it that you had a, a, a CEO, you had that new driving force, you had that catalyst for change. What you shared with us, though, included the fact that the compensation of every Ansel McCall executive is tied to um, your sustainability reports. Now, I am sure that would not have been an easy sell to, to, to get. I'm sure there must have been resistance, pushback. How will how was your board able to convince your executives that to be happy about this? Because that's what I really want to get. Well, Kamala, I don't know, you might be, you and everybody else may be surprised by, by this answer. The executives are who proposed that action or that path to the board for approval. So, so our balance, each company has a balance scorecard. And then there's an overall group balance scorecard. And at all levels, whether it be group or sub corporate or subsidiary level, um, the ESG metrics are included on the balance scorecard. And people are compensated based on the achievement, percentage achievement of your balance scorecard. 
the, the, the target set there. Um, that balance scorecard, the overall group balance scorecard, because everything rolls up into that group balance scorecard, was approved by the board. So it was an executive proposal that was made to the board, um, which was accepted. Mm -hmm. so well, you know, it was executive. Because right, I'm surprised at that. <laughs> but I would say to you, it also part of this process, and what I've really come to recognize over the years is that stakeholder engagement is extremely important. Uh, and that doesn't mean just external stakeholders, your internal stakeholders. So we spent a year in 2021, basically physically going from a corporate standpoint, engaging with our sector heads, our managing directors, the, the leadership, explaining to them the company's purpose, the direct, why we're choosing to go in this direction, um, what benefit it can bring to the environment, society, and also to their businesses. Because at the end of the day, most times when you take, when you undertake sustainability initiatives, there is usually an increase in efficiencies, which, which results in cost savings, which, which hit your bottom line positively. So we spent a lot of time engaging with all of our leaders, having discussions with them, getting their feedback on, you know, we tweaked some of the things that we came with. So it was a collaborative effort. So at the end of the day, they came up, it wasn't handed down from corporate. They came up with the ESG um, metrics and targets, um, which were then approved by the board. So stakeholder engagement is key in, in, in how should I say, anticipating pushback um, and dealing with it if it does, if it does come. Yes, because in fact, that, that's a question that Avia had for you in the chat now um, about pushback. So Avia, do you want to, to unmute and ask the question? Um, it's a nice, clear question in the chat. So, but if you're not able to... Okay, I'll ask it. So she's saying, um, Francis, uh, how did you and the leadership deal with pushback with this progressive agenda? So now it would be pushback, not just from at your executive level, but there might have been, you know, even lower down the line, the ad additional work to collect data and, and metrics. Right. Okay. So first of all, we are still in the process. In fact, we've just started the wider data collection and data discovery exercise. Because as I said, we had data and we were collecting data in many parts of our businesses before. But as we realize, sustainability is an ongoing process of improvement. So we're not perfect. We recognize that. And there is data collection and data discovery. Well, data discovery is happening now and data collection will, will be, you know, will, will be coming out of, of, of that. Um, and we are using an external, I don't know if I should, if I, if they would want me to say it, but we are using an external um, resource to help us with that. So again, further investment on our part to accelerate the process. Because if you have your people, your, your people on, you know, who are concerned with the day-to-day -day operations, now trying to um, delve into newer areas, uh, it, is, it is going to take longer. So in order to accelerate that, we've enlisted external, very qualified um, resources to help us with that data discovery and so on. And actually, we did some planned visits um, the other day. So, I mean, I was able to walk uh, the carb glass plant, the answer polymer, the, the, the answer polymer plant, um, you know, carib brewery itself. Uh, we 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 went to a lot of the the plants, and all of that was part of understanding the process. What waste? Um, what waste comes out of the process? What do we do with it? You know, what steps do we take? Do we audit third party companies who we hire to dispose? All of those things are coming out of the current exercise that is that is taking place. And then we also have um, lawyers who are specialized in this area who are assisting us as well in terms of helping us along, knowing what the reporting requirements will be because ultimately we would like to be going in tandem with reporting, international reporting standards. 
good. All right. I see Faye has her hand up. So Faye, I want to invite you to ask your question. Hi, thanks, Pamela, and thanks, Francis, for a great presentation. And I think it's, it's wonderful for us to have the ability to showcase some of these things that are being done. A lot of people don't actually read on your reports. So, you know, it's it's good to find to get it out there. The question I have is, you know, we, we have a lot of assumptions about pushback and you indicated a lot of support for the initiative from your leadership team, from your board, from your CEO. Did you, in fact, find that there were specific areas of pushback and, and where would those have come? What, what were the kinds of pushback you would have experienced, if any? To be honest, I think when it, it would have been only in the very initial stages when people would not have fully understood the direction and where we were coming from. So when we had those engagement sessions, we, we, um, we did three-day workshops with each sector across the group, right? And we have 10 sectors, right? So it was, it was a very hectic year for mm -hmm. me and my team. And, um, you know, when you got there, they were like, okay, some of them, okay, so this is what about giving away money, donations, what, you know, why are we spending all this time, I have a business to run, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, okay, this is, this is PR, this is what this is. And so we had to kind of lift that, that, that barrier and that understanding and explain to people that this has, yes, there's a, there's a branding and a PR aspect to it, but that is the that is the outcome. That is the form of communicating what you are doing, right? The essence here is something that we are trying to create that adds value to the society and to your business. It creates shared value. So it's not just about, and what we was, what we were, what we was impressing on them is that it can actually make your life easier allow you to meet your financial targets, which of course means that you are compensated better because if you meet your targets, you get higher compensation. And at the same time, while you're doing that, you are doing something good for society and for the environment, which you have a responsibility to do as business operators. And that is the direction that your board has taken. So getting them to really understand the direction in those sessions that we had at, you know for the most of for about halfway through 2020 um 2021 that would have been where we would have had the most initial feedback initial uh pushback but once that understanding was was um pushed yes correct was achieved then everybody was on board as i said to you once we got past that they created their, their targets and their metrics. They were the ones who went and did that and then came back and we approved or not approved or said tweak or whatever it is, the CEO would have said tweak or not. And then we would have collectively sent that to the, to the board for approval. All right. It's, it's, and some um, of those targets are in our sustainability um, report and our annual report. Yes, Francis, I want to beg you for a few additional minutes because it is 12.30, but this has been such an incredible uh, part so far. We have a question from Richard Nichols. Richard is from Guyana. So if Richard is able Hi, to Richard. And, and ask his question, I would be happy. If not, I will read out his question from the chat. Um, I know Richard is busy at work, you know, but it, it's so wonderful that we get, get persons from around the region be present and engage. Okay, so I haven't seen Richard on mute. Therefore, I'll ask the question. He said, hi, Francis. Is there an incentive for management to encourage expansion and execute such in initiatives to the wider partners or distributors in the region? And how does this affect the bottom line in the initial stage? Could you repeat that again for me? Right. So it's a great question because what he wants to know is whether there's a plan to encourage and execute these initiatives to your partners in the region. So distributors and all that. And then also, um, how does this affect your bottom line in the initial stage, which is what most companies have a difficulty with the huge investment that must happen up front um, for that kind of long term gain? Yeah. 
Okay, so in terms of investment, we are clearly committed to making the investment. Now, because, and I, I don't know if I should say answer Macal, because we have already been in progress of doing a lot of these initiatives, it isn't like a shock to the system. There have been plans always to um, improve the environmental um, impact of and, and, and societal impact of the group. Now, for example, the line seven, that is not something that was an overnight decision. That has been mulled over for a long time. And as I said, most of these initiatives usually increase efficiencies almost right away. Yes, mm -hmm. there are some where it's a long term, it's a long term, um, it's a long term investment. But for us, it's not that we are going to be burdened with costs and profits are going to decrease be, you know, overnight because we are investing in things. This has been a gradual. And now what has happened is that because of the formal structures that have been put in place, we can over a period of time address and prioritize um, the key impact areas and determine when to invest, when not to invest, so that it does not affect the bottom line negatively. Right. Um, yeah, in terms of your distributors and partners in the region. Most of our distributors and partners in the region are aware of where we're going and what we are doing. Now we have, where we distribute, we usually have businesses, operations there, but where we don't, they are aware of what our standards are and what we expect and they are briefed accordingly. And I want you to understand, Carib Brewery, on our end, we, we uh, brew products that for international brewers. So, for example, Cause Light is brewed by us in Trinidad. Heineken, as most people may know, is also brewed by us. We have to follow uh, their requirements and their standards in terms of brewing products and not just pertaining to their product. Overall, what is our, they want to know what our waste production is. Um, you know, what our water consumption. So we have to track those things as well for their benefit. Okay, great. I want to remind everyone the link to the survey has been put in the chat already by Christy. So please, if you uh, could take a moment, actually it's put by Joanne. So um, and sure you click on that link to give us feedback. Um, I, I do want to take this um, question from Janice Lamont Creek. So Janice, if you want to unmute and just ask the question, just stick to the exact question that you have um, presented here, <laughs> right? Yes, Good afternoon, everyone. My question is, what steps as a corporate secretary did you, well, you and the executive management take to get your directors on board with this whole process? Because at the end of the day, Ansel Macau Group is a family business and they do put directors on their board. Yes. So what steps were taken to get the directors in particular on board with this whole um, initiative? Thank you. Thank you. Was that Janice? Did I get your name? Yes. Right. Thank you, Janice, for that question. OK, so to start with, um, Anson McCall, you are right has a majority shareholder that is a family. So but however, we are a publicly listed company, and therefore we are regulated just like everyone else. So what I would say to you, first of all, and I mentioned it earlier, is that our CEO was a key uh, factor and driving force in taking this pause, reassessing, and then doubling down and driving towards international standards of governance and how we, how we do things. This was entirely supported by, sorry, by the way, in case you're not aware, our group CEO is a family member. That is Anthony Sabga III. So there was, there was no convincing there since the idea came from him, <laughs> right? And, and therefore, um, part of the process was in fact increasing the level of independence on our boards because we recognize that there's a majority shareholder. So now previously, we our structure was 
very highly executive directors on our parent board, our publicly listed board. Uh, that was a process that was revisited, a, a practice that was revisited. And frankly, what we did was introduced independent directors who do not rely on Ansa McCall for any sort of financial or other relationship or benefit to come on our board because it was the desire of the board, the family to have independent directors and to have their input to challenge, to, to give feedback, to give pushback on the approach that's being taken with regard to not just sustainability, but the direction of the group. So we are now actually at a roughly 50%, just over 50% independent directorship uh, on the board. So in terms of uh, convincing, really, uh, we have directors who are internationally based, albeit, albeit many of them are local, but internationally based and have had a lot of experience and exposure in sustainability practice. And therefore, it would have been welcomed. In fact, it was a deliberate um, choice and selection to choose people with those skills in addition to other skills because this was the desired direction that the group was going to take. Okay. I hope that answers, Janice. Yes, it, it, it does actually um, explain that. So um, we do need to bring this session to an end now to be able to prepare for our first panel discussion to follow. So um, there are a couple of comments in the chat, which I'll, I, I will read to end off, but there's a question from Miriam Abdul Richards. Um, Francis, it's a, it's a tough one, but hopefully you'll be able to answer it very succinctly. Yeah. She wants to know how the sustainability ESG initiatives have been accelerated into ESG reporting through assurances at the level of the audit committees. And, and how has that given, how has that been given, given the diversity of operations across the group? Okay, so as I said, this is a process, but all of our charters, our committee charters have been adjusted to, first of all, to reflect where the various aspects of sustainability will, will rest. So our GNRC is responsible for the overall oversight of um, sustainability, uh, the framework, how we are progressing in terms of the implementation and stress testing that. Our audit and risk committee will look at through our enterprise risk management framework, our audit and risk committee will look at sustainability risk, both from the standpoint of the impact on our business, the impact that we have on, on external impact, and then risk to the sustainability initiatives themselves, right? So there is a formal structure where, and a rigorous one in place now where the, the the both committees in their respective um, areas, defined areas in their charters, which by the way are available online uh, at our, on our website, so it's not a secret, um, their rules and definitions have been defined. So that comes up to those committees for review, for feedback, for pushback, um, for testing, for stress testing. Excellent. Thank you. So Miriam, I want Miriam, does that answer your question? I am sure. Yes, it does. Thank you very much, Francis. And thank you for sharing all the information. I mean, as a director on, in the answer family, it was very clear and well done. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So I want to also um, share Nicole Thomas's uh, comment. She says, Francis, thank you for the authenticity in your depiction of ANSA's sustainability journey. Absolutely refreshing. And then we had from Latoya. She says, it's great to hear from Francis that the initial pushback related to assumptions around the traditional CSR based initiatives and to hear that the buy in was almost immediate once business leaders understood that ESG was intended to go far beyond philanthropy. And I think this is an absolutely great comment for us to end the session. It's from Aline Makumi. Aline said, Francis, your presentation has given me hope. It will be great 
if other companies in TNT and the region take example and find slash begin to change ahead of the curve. Excellent presentation. I think Aline said it best. Thank you very much, Kamala, Faye, all of uh, the, the uh, Christy, family. Know, everybody, the whole family. And thank you very much, everyone who came online to listen to the presentation today. I enjoyed every minute of it. It's something I'm very passionate about and it's a privilege to share it with others and discuss these very important issues that mean a lot to, to all of us. Thank you, Francis. So you know that we will be reaching out to you again, because as you say, this is not a one-time thing. This is a journey. We have to be sharing. We have to be talking. We have to help ensure that everyone understand. Um, there's no, as I said in the earlier thing, there's no playbook. You know, we have to develop and find a way to help make this work for us in the region. So I thank you sincerely. And I thank everyone else, as you said, for having logged in um, to be part of this morning's opening. I think it's a brilliant start for today.